What's up, guys? Crypto Muser here with your daily news and analysis in the crypto markets. So, guys, today Bitcoin is kind of ranging in that thirty-eight to forty thousand dollar level. Um, last night we had a nice little uh, bullish momentum that brought us above forty thousand for a second there, but then quickly rejected um, below forty thousand. So it wasn't good there. We need to really get above that forty to forty-one thousand dollar resistance, and then we could actually have some bullish momentum pushing us further to maybe you know forty-five, fifty thousand. But until then, we're kind of in this limbo land. Um, where especially everything going on with Ukraine and Russia, um, we're on a day-to-day, um, day-to-day basis at this point, right? I mean, it was good to see us, you know, recover from that initial crash a couple days ago, but like like I said, now we're kind of ranging in this in this thirty-eight to forty forty thousand dollar price level, and like I said, we'll see what happens uh, moving into next week. But XRP, on the other hand, has done very well. Uh, whenever there's some bullish momentum. Um, it seems like XRP kind of decouples from the market and, and has some extra muscle behind it, right? Um, you know, yesterday, Bitcoin was up about 2 or 3%, and XRP uh, was up about 14%, right? It just, you know, everything with this lawsuit, with the sediment looming, um, there's just some extra hype around XRP, obviously, right? So definitely look for XRP uh, to be one of the lead alts um, in the coming weeks, especially if Bitcoin can break above that $41,000 resistance like we were talking about and maybe have some upward trend up towards, you know, 45 to 50,000. Um, XRP, you know, like I said, everything just around XRP right now with this with the lawsuit, I think a settlement is coming in the co- next couple of weeks. Um, you know, not financial advice, but definitely keep a close eye on XRP. Um, but it's, before I get into this video, guys, I just want to ask you if you could please like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. It'd be very much appreciated. But let's get right into it, guys. I have a quick update on the uh, Ripple versus SEC lawsuit. Um, so a couple of days ago, the SEC um, brought a filing to reconsider, to have the judge reconsider um, her ruling on the drafts and emails of the William Hinman speech, right? Now, when this case first started, William Henman was brought in for a deposition for Ripple. And under oath, he stated that the speech he gave in 2018 was his own personal opinion, right? And if it's his own personal opinion, then the documents and emails and anything related to that speech should not be protected under DPP. But obviously, the SEC did not um, want to hand over those documents. So a couple days ago, they, they had a rebuttal. Uh, it's saying that now, <laughs> and it's crazy what they're saying now. So now that uh, now it's not William Hammond's personal opinion that speech. Now that speech was actually the opinion of the Division of Corporate Finance within the SEC. So basically, what they're saying is they're basically throwing William Hammond under under the bus at this point. Um, it's not William Hammond's, William Hammond's personal opinion, which he said under oath that it was. Now it is the opinion of the Division of Corporate Finance within the SEC. So like I said, they're throwing Bill Hemmen under the bus and uh, either, you know, either Bill Hemmen was lying under oath or the SEC is lying and changing, um, changing their whole opinion on this, right? Either way, it looks terrible for the SEC. And we were waiting for a rebuttal from Ripple on all this. And we got it last night and it did not disappoint, guys. So James Filing uh, gave us the filing. James Filing gave us a filing. Uh, Ripple and the individual defendants have filed their opposition to the SEC's motion for partial reconsideration and clarification of Judge Netburn's DPP ruling, noting that the SEC is simply seeking a do-over. So, like I said, you know, they said it already in this case that that was um, Bill Hemmings personal opinion, and the SEC, SEC agreed with this, right? That was until the judge ordered for these documents to be handed over, and all of a sudden, um, the SEC changed their tune very quickly. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious there's something damning in these emails, right? Um, so, um, it's so funny when you see SC change their tune so quickly. I mean, like I said, there's definitely something really bad in these emails. And I just don't think those emails will ever see the light of day. But let's just hear what um, the attorneys and the XRP community said about this filing. Because I'm not a judge. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, obviously. So let's just hear what a lawyer, a couple lawyers in the XRP community say about this. Um, so Jeremy Hogan tweeted this out. Wow, I expected Ripple to come out swinging, and this brief did not disappoint. And he hashtag Matt Solomon, who's the um, head lawyer uh, with Ripple, and he actually did, um, filed this filing. Um, this is the hardest hitting brief thus far in this litigation, and rightfully so. The SEC has spun itself in a tangled web here, and I don't expect the judge to help them out at all. 
Um, exactly, right? I just do not see the judge helping them out in this because the the SEC is basically making themselves look like idiots at this point, and the judge is going to see right through this, right? So let's just see what John Deaton said about this too. Um, the uh, the Ripple lawyers are professional and very tactful in explaining that the court, um, if the court were to accept the SEC's new theory regarding the speech, that the you know that the speech is the Division of Corporate Finance's opinion and not Bill Himmons' opinion. Um, then the court must accept the fact that Himmon lied under oath. So exactly what I said in the beginning of the video, either they're throwing Bill Himmon under the bus, saying that he lied under oath, or um, basically the SC is changing their whole opinion on the whole on the speech. And let's just let's just re quickly read the filing, um, the actual filing that uh, Ripple had here. Um, when he was deposed in the case, William Hemmen testified that he believed that his speech provided clarity as to why, how I, Bill Hemmen, was looking at these issues. Um, and then he continued on and said, The SEC now seems to suggest that Mr. Hemmen's sworn declaration and deposition testimony were at least misleading, arguing that the speech all along reflected not only Mr. Hemmen's personal opinion, but also represented the, the view of the Division of Corporate Finance. Um, this reversal effectively repudiates the SEC's prior litigation position in the case. So perfectly worded, worded by the uh, attorneys at Ripple. Um, you can't have it both ways, right? And the, like I said, the judge is going to see right through this. There's no way that um, Judge Netburn allows this um, these documents to be, to be protected. Um, the thing about this is that this is Judge Netburn. This is the discovery part of this case, right? So I believe Judge Netburn in the next couple of days or so will, um, you know, deny um, the reconsideration by the SEC and order them to hand over these documents. But what the SEC can do after that is appeal to Judge Torres, the lead judge in this case, um, to basically appeal it to Judge Torres um, for a reconsideration. So I think that the, both judges know this is going to happen. So I think that Judge Torres will pro probably be ready for this. And, um, you know, soon after that... Um, um, appeal, you'll probably see Judge Torres give her give her um, judgment on this. And um, I believe, and I, I'm not the only one that thinks this, but I think as soon as Judge Torres um, orders the SEC to hand over these documents, um, that you will see a settlement. Because I think there's something so damning in these emails that the, that the SEC cannot afford to give them out. Right? I think that they probably, what it is, is that they probably had XRP um, mentioned in the first drafts of the speech, and then they probably took it out later because, you know, which is, you know, beyond me, you know, if if you're only trying to give Ethereum and Bitcoin clarity in the market here, and, um, you know, obviously it was the, the top three cryptos at the time were Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and XRP. So why not keep XRP in that speech? And that's the big question in all this. You know, why not keep XRP in that speech? And then why all of a sudden, two years later, come up with this um, this lawsuit against Ripple and XRP? It just doesn't look good. Um, there's obviously some conflicts of interest here, and we'll get into some of that later on in the video, but none of this looks good for the SEC, bottom line. So, like I said, a settlement is probably coming in the coming weeks, and I do, and that probably will be as soon as uh, the judge orders for these documents to be handed over. So look for that, and I mean, for sure, in the next week or so, right? So definitely heating up in this case, for sure, right? And also something I saw that, gave me some, you know, insight in what Ripple, how Ripple is thinking in all this. Um, Brad Ellis tweeted this out. Ripple employees are saying Brad Garling, our CEO of Ripple, has been attending some high-level meetings in recent days. Man has become a center, the center of attention for top U.S. government and Federal Reserve officials. There's some rumblings out there, guys, that Brad Garlinghouse is, is in some meetings with some high-level officials within the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve. You know, what these meetings are about, I mean, we don't know, obviously, but we know when this, um, when this settlement comes in this case that Ripple is intending to go public in IPO. So, I mean, if you look at the last year of business for Ripple, they've bl absolutely blown up all around the world. But they're obviously trying to, they're a U.S. company, they're trying to go after that, you know, the, the finance fan, financial um, business in the U.S. because it is the biggest, um, you know, obviously the biggest um, economy, world economy, or biggest economy in the world. So... Once this uh, case settles and that XRP has clarity in the market, that means Ripple can go about business in the U.S. And you got to believe that institutions or banks are just waiting for this to settle so they can get on board. 
because you see everything going on in the world right now. The best thing for you know most banks and institutions right now are um, the, exactly what Ripple can offer. You know, you know, payments, uh, faster payments, and faster um, cross-border remittances are one of the most important things in the world of finance as, as we speak. So, guys, all I'm saying, like, not financial advice, but Ripple going uh, going public and IPOing, and and obviously, you know, if their Ripple's business business explodes in the U.S., what do you think that's going to do with the price of XRP? You know, not gonna like I said, not financial advice, but um, probably going to help the price of XRP. Maybe you think? Just look, just look into it, guys. I'm just asking questions. Um, let's get into something else, though. So, when Power Oversight is this um, government oversight agency that sued the SEC um, in the last couple of months, and they're basically trying to get documents um, relating to conf- conflicts of interest with that Bill Hemmen speech, right? Um, it is documented that Bill Hemmen got paid $15 million by a law firm that worked for the Ethereum Alliance while he was at the SEC. And not only that, um, bu- um, building up to that speech he gave about Ethereum, um, weeks and months before that speech, he had meetings with members of the Ethereum Alliance, like Joe Lubin and others, um, and it just didn't look right, right? It just, um, obviously, it looks like there's some conflicts of interest there, and this government oversight agency is basically just asking uh, the SEC to be more transparent, and um, due to the, the Freedom of Information Act, it looks like we're going to get some emails and documents that relate to um, William Hemmen and any of those meetings or emails he had with people that work for the Ethereum Alliance, right? The SEC, the SEC has obviously been dragging their feet in all this, and they have only given up a couple emails or a couple documents as of as of now. But the over uh, Empower Oversight is definitely holding their feet to the fire, and it looks like we're going to get a lot of documents in the coming weeks. So Empower Oversight tweeted this out yesterday. Um, SEC releases emails to Empower Oversight and Crypto Conflicts uh, lawsuit, still searching for more. And then it continues down, down and says, after suing the SEC for documents related to potential conflicts of interest in the cryptocurrency-related enforcement decisions, Empower Oversight has obtained the first documents from the SEC as a result of this litigation under FOIA. Um, however, due to the formatting issues, many of those uh, pages are entirely blank and contain duplicate information. Um, On February 18th, Empower Oversight provided a detailed list of people associated with the entities named in the FOIA request uh, so that the SEC can relate identity, uh, uh, sorry, requests so that the SEC can identify additional response records rather than limiting its searches, just uh, certain email address domains. So basically what the uh, government uh, Empower Oversight did was they gave the SEC a, a, group, a, a list of names, right? A list of names, uh, people that work for the um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. And what they want is any emails or documents that, that conversations that William Hinman had with these people. And if there were no emails, if there were some emails, um, we want to see them. We want those, um, those emails to be public information, Right. Because obviously, if um, you know if there were emails or conversations with William Hinman before this uh, ETH free pass speech, and it obviously what, who does that benefit? Who does this, who does that speech benefit? Anybody involved with Ethereum, obviously, right? So if there are conversations with anybody within the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance um, before that speech was made, then that needs to be seen, right? We need to see if there was anything illegal here. Was there any insider trading, right? So we will get these documents, and obviously there's some big names on this list. Um, we have Joe Lubin, uh, Vitalik Buterin, and um, also we have um, Mike Novogratz. I mean, big names on that list, and there's a lot of names on that list too. So, like I said, there could be nothing here, right? We could be all a bunch of crazy people, and they call us conspiracy theorists and all this, whatever. You know, we could be all wrong, right? But we need to know. They need to be more transparent about this stuff because obviously it doesn't look good, right? So until um, they hand over these documents and these emails, um, then what do they have to hide, right? If they want to say there's nothing there, then hand over the documents, bottom line. So we will know, obviously, in the coming weeks to see what happens there. Um, Next thing I want to uh, show you guys. 
So Russian uh, financiers uh, could turn to crypto to circumvent sanctions, industry experts say. So we've been see, hearing this a lot the last couple of days about um, all these sanctions that the U.S., EU, U.K. has been ha um, handing down to Russia, right? And a lot of people have been saying that, you know, obviously we saw, you know, Russia was banning crypto. And then all of a sudden in the coming weeks uh, before this invasion, they were trying to regulate it. And um, they were all of a sudden pro Bitcoin and crypto. So it didn't make any sense to people, right? But then now it's making a little more sense, right? Now it's they're saying that they're going to use crypto to circumvent these sanctions. So let's get into this article and see how they can do that. All right. So they generally would view a trans... So they, they're saying the US, the EU, the UK, um, they generally would view a transaction conducted in Bitcoin or any other asset uh, the same way they would view a transaction conducted in dollars. US-based cryptocurrency exchanges uh, and wallet providers must follow the same uh, reporting and know your customer KYC regulations as banks. But decentralized exchanges and marketplaces in other countries may offer a workaround. So what he's saying, what they're saying is that, you know, centralized exchanges that are KYC regulated, um, there's no way that Russia could use those exchanges to get around the sanctions. But if they use decentralized exchanges out there, then that's a way they could maybe do that, right? As long as they don't use U.S. regulated entities uh, to purchase or move crypto, I don't think that it would be that difficult to avoid these sanctions. Employing a number of different exchanges would uh, also make it easier for the Russian financiers to cover their tracks. Um, hold on a second, let me get rid of this. Um, Russian companies could quite easily use Russia-based exchanges or brokers as fiat on-ramps and then transact in crypto across multiple decentralized exchanges or through other tools meant to conceal uh, the source of funds. Then entities uh, willing to engage with them could potentially transact without facing any real consequences. So yes, they could use to, uh, multiple decentralized exchanges, but you know, with the, the, the thing with decentralized exchanges is there's not a lot of liquidity on them, right? Um, if they wanna move millions and millions of dollars, it's gonna be hard for them. And I don't think Russia has, has um, crypto down packed that much where they can actually um, get around these sanctions as best as they want to, right? And I think that most people probably understand that at this, at this point. Yes, they probably can somehow, you know, move some money around and, and get around them in some ways, but I just don't think that the, um, the infrastructure is there for them to really use it the way they want to, right? So let's just see what the EU and other countries are saying about all this. As you know, I don't know if you do know actually, but the EU has been trying to um, ban proof-of-work tokens like, like Bitcoin all of a sudden. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, they were saying that they wanted to make uh, to vote on this any day now. And then all of a sudden, the Russia-Ukraine thing happened and they kind of postponed it, right? And in this article, EU postpones bill to ban uh, proof-of-work tokens. And uh, let's just get into this article. European Central Bank uh, President Christine Lagarde called for an immediate regulations on cryptocurrencies and the bloc citing potential use by Russia to bypass recent economic sanctions. Speaking with reporters during an informal meeting of ministers for the economy of finance on Friday, Lagarde said lawmakers needed to act quickly to regulate the growing asset class. So it seems to me now, um, now they don't want to ban proof of work or, or Bitcoin. Now they want to regulate it. Because now I think they're seeing that by them banning Bitcoin or banning crypto, um, that doesn't help them um, to stop Russia from getting around these sanctions. But by you know, regulating this industry, and if the, you know, the U.S. by regulating the industry, they can you know, figure out how um, they can punish Russia in other ways than just these sanctions that they're giving out right now. Because obviously it's not working. I mean, they gave, they've been sanctioning Russia for years now, and it really has done nothing um, for Putin. It hasn't persuaded Russia from doing anything that they want them to do, right? So by them regulating um, crypto and them actually educating themselves in crypto, um, then they can figure out better ways to sanction Russia and they can figure out how they can stop Russia from you know, circumventing these sanctions, right? Um, you're going to see obviously more and more information about all this in the coming weeks because um, as much as all these sanctions are going to be bad for Russia, they're going to try to figure a way to get around this, right? And cri yes, crypto is maybe a way to get around it. But just like, you know, obviously there's nefarious ways to use crypto. There's also very good ways to use crypto. 
just like you see in, in um, Ukraine, um, you're seeing people, you know, funding, um, sending money to Ukraine to help them, help the people in Ukraine, help the, the uh, military in, UK, in Ukraine. People are sending in crypto, sending in Bitcoin. I mean, obviously, banks are tough. It's tough to send money with, uh, using banks in a war zone, right? But it is much easier to send cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin um, into a country like Ukraine right now. And that's how they're getting, I think it was about $6 million that was sent into Ukraine in the last couple of days. So like I said, you're going to have obviously nefarious ways to use crypto, just like you, you know, in, in the internet, right? There's obviously nefarious ways to use the internet, but also internet, the internet is, uh, has revolutionized the world. So in every new technology, there's going to be bad actors involved. And, and you can't just, all, just because Russia is trying to use cryptocurrency to get around um, sanctions, you can't just start banning uh, crypto. That's not the way to go about it. And you're seeing a smart woman like Christine Lagarde coming out saying, you know, we shouldn't ban it, but we need to regulate it. That's the big thing about these countries. They, they've, been holding, they've been holding back on regulating this, um, this, this industry and it's just it's been hurting them in the long run. And now they're at this this like this point now where you know Russia is gonna obviously use crypto to get around these sanctions. So they need to get the shit together, basically, right? And it's good to see Christine Lagarde, you know, kind of seeing that aspect and saying, you know, we need to regulate this asset class now um, before Russia can use this technology um, to get around these sanctions. So, like I said, you're gonna see a lot more coming out of this in the coming weeks, obviously, but um, obviously I'll keep you guys up to date on, on everything going on. Um, I'm up to date. I'm trying to keep, um, uh, and I'm researching every day. If anything comes down, I, I, you know, try to put in these videos, but, um, just remember guys, uh, please like subscribe and leave comments down below. But remember, I'm not a financial advisor. Please do not take anything a writer say as financial advice. This is for educational purposes only guys. And thanks. And we'll see you on the next one.